Hello, religious friends. Uh, the first chapter of this course dedicated to the bishop pair is going to cover a very practical uh, issue of having the bishop pair. Uh, so the bishop's ability to dominate opponent's pieces. Uh, and uh, in this chapter, I've decided to pick three uh, parts of the games uh, where one of the players, the one having the bishop pair, uh, managed to uh, outplay the opponent mainly due to the fact that he had the bishop pair. So the bishops enabled him to enjoy uh, a bigger flexibility as regards playing the, the position itself uh, because the bishops um, dominated and restricted opponent's pieces in such a way that uh, it was just uh, very pleasant to, to play um, to play the game and of course uh, if the opponent's pieces are passive then usually his whole position uh, becomes problematic. So the first example is actually a game that I played against uh, a great friend friend of mine uh, Mateusz Dubinski in uh, Krakow Open in uh, 2018 uh, and I'm playing here with white pieces um, Despite the horrible opening that um, that I played in this game, I somehow managed to escape with this position. Um, so my opponent uh, is up a pawn, but uh, well, at the same time I have the bishops, so there is some compensation already. Um, as a word of introduction, perhaps you may may wonder why there is such a thing in chess like a bishop pair and practically no one ever uh, refers to knight pair. Well, the bishop uh, is a piece, a long range piece, which itself means that uh, in an open position uh, it will quite easily dominate the knight because the knight is just a slow jumper which needs to um, move many many times to get to one square and the bishops uh, can move on the entire diag diagonal in just one move. And if you combine two bishops and make them uh, sort of shoot in the same direction, then uh, as a result you get whole uh, lots of squares covered by those bishops and they create a sort of a barrier which is very often difficult to cross uh, because um, they just cooperate so well together. And the knights to be strong, they just they just need an outpost very often, or they need an, a closed position. Uh, so they do not really cooperate with each other. Very often, in fact, uh, there is just one or two good spots in a position, and if one of the knight occupies, uh, if, if one of the knights occupies this this square, then the other uh, just suffers from lack of space. Uh, that's why we actually do refer. To the bishop pair, such a thing exists, and the knight pair, well, not really. So coming to the position, um, obviously black had to go back with the knight to g4. Uh, I played rook c1, and here all of a sudden it transpires that black is struggling to find a reasonable plan for himself. Um, and this is all thanks to the fact that my bishops, so those two pieces, um, even though they are not extremely active, they are not doing anything miraculous, um, but they do control many squares. So as you see the bishop could go to d6, but still on f4 it does control the entire diagonal, restricting for example the rook on c8. So the rook cannot play, cannot go to c7 uh, in order to double up along c file and for instance hit this pawn on c3. Um, the same could be said about the bishop on d3 because uh, it very nicely works on those two diagonals. Uh, so, as a comparison, those knights on g4 and d7 don't really have a good square to go, because if you take a look at the knight's possibilities, where, uh, well, the knights really cannot be improved. The knight on g4 is doing literally nothing here, and the fact that uh, white does not have his h pawn is uh, completely irrelevant. So. This position is actually much better for white, ha despite um, having the material deficit, simply because of the fact that the black's pieces cannot do much. Uh, it's really difficult to find any reasonable plan. Uh, in fact, black would very, in, in many situations like this, he would love to give back the material, for instance, by means of e5, 
so uh, something like this but then uh, this doesn't really solve any problems because it transpires that after bishop f5 uh, again the, the bishop um, makes a huge impact and uh, white can even take the pawn in the very next move but uh, if black just does something like it takes f4 then after bishop takes d7 uh, all of the sudden white is just winning an exchange and probably the game so it is just not possible to uh, to free the pieces and and even at the cost of a pawn black uh, cannot find any reasonable active play uh, so in the game my opponent went a5 i played bishop a6 forcing the rook to go back to a8 and then i went back to b5 uh, and thanks to this little maneuver, uh, now again the bishop uh, the bishop hits the the knight on d7. Uh, this bishop controls the entire diagonal, and in fact there is many tactical tricks. So if black goes rook d8, he often needs to think about the consequences of bishop c7. Um, bishop c6 may also be a threat, and then harassing the rook. Um, Often it will not result in any material gain, but it will just be very unpleasant because uh, black is very restricted on his half of the board and the rooks don't have enough squares to go. So it's actually very easy to, to blunder an exchange uh, in one line or another. Uh, so in this position, um, my opponent uh, decided just to, to go back to, to f6. So there was knight, knight f6 and I just played c4. Uh, and actually those pawns um, help the bishops in a great way because um, well they also control quite a lot of ground and um, along with the bishops they just don't allow black to do anything. Uh, again a practical solution could have been to, 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 to look for something like e5 but there was never uh, really time to do that because here e5 just fails to impress d takes e5 may be an option or even um even bishop takes e5 i'm, I'm sure that um white is just much much better there uh, so black just went uh, rook f to c8 to oppose c5 idea because if the pawn moves forward uh, it becomes a very dangerous passer and uh, i'm sure it would be horribly difficult to to do anything about this uh, so white really enjoys great flexibility uh, and I could have improved my position maybe even by doubling up along c file um, and and then try to, to play c5 um, but I felt that it's much more reasonable to even to restrict black's pieces even more and for this reason I played bishop d6 which is also a multi-purpose move because now c5 is um, is just a threat because the c5 score is protected once more by the bishop uh, and at the same time um, black is deprived of an idea uh, such as king uh, king f8 now the, the king cannot move to the square uh, which makes it uh, very problematic because as you know in the end games uh, you would love all of your pieces including the king to be activated uh, so on bishop d6 uh, black decided to try uh, a pretty smart idea i have to say so this knight intends to go to c6 then hitting the the pawn on d4 potentially jumping to this sort of sort of an outpost on b4 and if that um, occurs on the board then probably black's position is uh, well maybe not enjoyable but there is actually some hope in in his position uh, so on knight b8 I decided to uh, minimize the danger of black getting anything, any any joy in, in this game and that's why I played d5 using a very simple trick that after e d5 which was played in the game cd5, uh, rook c1, rook c1 and knight d5 is impossible due to checkmate on c8 so uh, with this little trick I, am, I managed to open the position and that's the first tip for you whenever you play with a bishop pair remember open the position to the biggest degree possible um bishops feel free they feel 
uh, great if they have enough fresh air, if they if they have space that uh, they can use, uh, and the more open diagonals, the better for the bishops. And on the contrary, if you ha if you play against the bishop pair, you usually prefer the position to be closed. Um, so here uh, the bishops, uh, of course, just dominate the position um, in, in a fantastic way. And after rook, rook c1, there was knight bd7, bishop c7. And now the bishop hits the pawn on b6, preparing a d6, further march of the pawn. And then it will be just about removing the blockade. So uh, something like d6, rook e1, rook e7. Uh, and then once the knight needs to move, then potentially further the pawn could go to d7. Uh, so here after um, after this bishop c7 move there was a4 d6 rook a5 uh, and now i i found the a trick bishop takes d7 winning the pawn um, which i'm going to explain in a moment but bishop c6 was a very interesting possibility which um, i considered um, a bit uh, th the problem was that we, we were both short of time so um, I just went for a tactical solution which I immediately saw and bishop c6 uh, objectively was a bit better because that maintains uh, horrific pressure and black just suffers a lot because rook c5 is not going to help him all that much because after rook takes c5 if b takes c5 bishop takes a4 uh, such a bishop two bishops against two knights end game is just completely winning uh, especially that knights are just hopeless against fighting against um, when fighting uh, against such pawns so that would be a killer and if b takes uh, if knight takes c5 i just play bishop takes b6 so probably we should see that on the board bishop takes b6 um, and then okay black can go something like uh, knight f to d7 but uh, even this takes takes d7 knight e6 uh, and then bishop takes a4 uh, this just needs to be winning uh, although maybe there is something even even stronger um, probably that would be difficult to find but uh, well white is definitely on top here uh, instead i went for a little combination uh, which was pleasant to find uh, here apparently bishop takes b6 wins the pawn because on knight takes b6 um, well there is this beautiful beautiful trick in fact rook c6 i think also may also work uh, but uh, rook c8 uh, knight takes c8 and then d7 and it's just impossible to cover both d7 uh, d8 and and c8 squares so uh, on rook d5 there's d takes c, uh, c8 on rook c5 there's d8 promotion on uh, rook a there's also d8 queen and white just uh, gives checkmate in one uh, unfortunately for me my opponent saw that despite being short of time um, and the game uh, continued he went rook a8 i went bishop d4 f6 uh, as you see the bishops one of the bishops were exchanged um, in, in, in exchange for that I managed to to get material back uh, and this actually was not a clean way to convert this advantage although objectively speaking white is still much much better and this is a technically uh, should be a technically technically winning position very difficult to defend uh, most definitely uh, but uh, the the previous line I, I've shown, so the one without taking the knight on on d7, uh, was probably a bit more precise. Uh, so here I just try to liquidate uh, the the blockade on d7, rook e1, rook d8. Now knight e5 could be a simplification idea for black, so f4 preventing this, knight b8. Uh, now a simple trick, bishop b6, rook d6 doesn't work due to bishop c7. Or even rook e8 followed by followed by rook takes b8. Uh, so uh, me, my opponent played rook c8, rook e7. Now d7 is the threat, so knight c6, rook e4, uh, hitting the pawn on a4. This is uh, 
if, if that happens, then black is just hopeless because the pawn d6 is much is is too strong. Uh, he played king f7, but uh, this is just winning d7, rook b8, bishop c7, rook a8, f5. Uh, the the idea is just to bring the rook to e6, and then it's all over. G6, rook e6, knight d4, rook d6. Uh, black resigned in view of d8 queen, uh, and that is just um, of course over. So as you saw in this game, uh, despite being down the pawn, which was completely irrelevant, uh, white just uh, smashed black uh, due to the flexibility and the possibility to control lots of squares, lots of important squares, and the, bish the knights were just uh, stuck on where they were, even though my opponent tried remaneuvering those pieces, it was just impossible. Okay, so let's move on to the next example. Uh, so this is a position taken from uh, Grishuk against Eronian uh, from Tata Steel 2011. Uh, and here uh, Black just played knight f6, uh, preparing knight g4. And uh, it was possible to play f3 or h3 preventing that. But, well, let's just say that that wouldn't really uh, pose uh, Black with any problems. So the position will be approximately approximately equal. Black has the bishop pair, but a slightly damaged pawn structure, so there is uh, there are imbalances here, and both sides can play for a win. Um, but Alexander Grischuk just went for a, a more ambitious plan. He played f4, claiming space and trying to show that the bishops are not so strong, uh, and and White's pawn majority on king side. Is, Plus the the better pawn pawn formation uh, is just uh, a much important um, strategic factor. Uh, Aronian went for the bishops, so knight g4, uh, playing bishop d2 or bishop c1 just to escape with the bishops. Um, with the bishop would fail due to bishop c5. Then I think it's quite easy even to imagine this without putting pieces on the board. Uh, once the bishop once the bishop is gone from e3 and black plays bishop c5, the knight on d4 is just lost. So. Uh, I'm sure Grishuk um, saw that in advance. So he played rook d1, knight e3, queen e3. And now white's threat is e5, so black played f6. And we have a very interesting position here, because as mentioned, black has the bishop pair fighting against two knights, so a sort of a situation we saw a moment ago. But the position is not entirely open. There is a few diagonals open, uh, but um, since there is so many pawns on the board, uh, the position is uh, rather, well, I would say dynamic, so it's not really clear whether it's going to be closed or open, because if white plays f5, for example, then that would permanently close the c8, h3 diagonal, but on the other hand, b8, h2 diagonal will be open. So, with this pawn mass, especially f4, e4 pawns, um, white remains uh, great flexibility and he can do pretty much whatever he wants. But of course, um, Aronian just played patiently, kept the bishops uh, alive, and uh, made sure that when the time comes, when the position gets open, the bishops will strike. So let's see what happened. Um, knight c2 e2. So uh, Grishuk is trying to find the optimal spot for this knight. Queen e7, king h1, sidestepping any ideas along a7 g1 diagonal. Rook e1, knight g3. Queen f7, uh, and now it sort of looks like um, the pawn center that uh, Grishuk has is not as strong as it may seem to be. Okay, it does control practically the entire center, but it can also prove to be uh, a liability because the pawn e4 is subject to attack as you see the rook on e8. Puts, puts great pressure on this pawn. Uh, so white has more space, white is probably more active, uh, but uh, black just waits for the right moment to strike. Uh, b3 restricting the queen, bishop g4, rook d2 e1, bishop d7. So that is just a little maneuver, eventually bishop has been developed, so that's a nice achievement. 
And uh, here this is probably one of the critical moments of the game, because uh, uh, White was really struggling to find the, the right idea uh, to go for. He played knight f3, but it was very interesting to play e5. Um, unfortunately, after e5, black is for, unfortunately for white. Uh, black is not forced to take f takes e5 because that would open the, the position. So uh, let's just imagine e5, f takes e5, f takes e5, and then this rook comes with great force, hitting the queen on, f, on f7. And also, possibly white could further go e6, or in some lines, even just take on d6. So that's uh, sort of a tactical point. Um, but after e5, black can just ignore that, play bishop c5, maintain the bishop pair, and take on e5 once he is just ready. Uh, so this was probably not the, the greatest uh, alternative. So in that context, knight f3 looks like a decent try. Uh, but still, it looks like Grishuk has a space advantage, but cannot really use it. Uh, rook d8. Finally, e5, but this is just a completely different version of the same idea. Uh, take, white takes with the pawn, and queen g6. Uh, this is quite an important uh, move. It sidesteps the it sidesteps the ideas on f file, also hits the pawn on c2, and in some positions the queen might be used for attacking the white king uh, because now it's. Um, put some pressure on the pawn on g2. Queen a7, so black is uh, also having some issues with the queen side um, pawn structure. Bishop b4, of course something like this needs to be done because otherwise the, the bishop on d6 will be taken or the pawn on b7. So uh, with this little move um, Aronian just uh, makes uh, Grishuk deal with his own problems. Rook d1, bishop c8, queen f2, uh, rook takes d1, rook takes d1, rook f8. So with this little little exchange, uh, you may get a feeling that already Aronian is trying to seize the initiative. And it's actually quite true. Even though white has a passer on e5, it's never going to, to move forward. And in fact... Um, now it it is white who is under some pins. A uh, few diagonals have been opened, and the knights on g3 and f3 are just very passive, while the rook on d1 is shooting empty squares on on the, on the d file. So uh, it's really not not uh, what should have happened from Grishuk's perspective. Um, queen e2. Bishop e7, Rook f1, h6, so waiting but improving the position, Knight d4, and this is definitely a mistake. Uh, it was uh, not advisable for Grishuk to make anything, uh, any any simplification uh, moves on the board, uh, because now uh, after c5. Rook takes f8, bishop takes f8, uh, knight f3, mm, it's just much easier for, for black to play. Without the rooks, there is no danger, uh, white has no counterplay whatsoever. Um, a moment ago, he still had some some issues with maybe preventing the pawn from, from e5 uh, to, to go forward. Uh, also, the king, the black king was not entirely safe. And now... Even though, structurally speaking, white is still much better, the bishops uh, really get to play uh, and they very easily dominate the, the white knight. So let's see uh, how Aronian converted his positional advantage. Um, first bishop e6. Blockading the, the passed pawn is very often a good idea uh, and it's impossible to remove the blockade since d4 square is covered by the pawn on c5. That's a very important detail. Knight f1, b5. So Aronian is trying to take advantage of his pawn structure on uh, queen side. c4 prevents a uh, further move on of, of the pawn. So c4 move would actually, if black played c4, uh, that would enable him to undouble the pawns, so which would already be a, a huge achievement. c4 is an attempt to stop that, but because of this move, 
after bc4 bc4 even though it looks like black sp um, black spawn structure is just ugly but in fact it is the c4 pawn which will prove to be a weakness and the fact that black has such a bad looking pawn structure means totally nothing it's just they look bad but they're uh, very strong and they're uh, everything is under black's control here uh, so black played queen b1 and now everything just falls apart from white's perspective h3 queen c1 knight d2 bishop e7 so the second bishop gets into play and white is still deprived of any active play king h2 bishop g5 so now bishop f4 bishop takes d2 uh, these ideas uh, are something that uh, Grishuk always needs to keep in mind g3 queen c2 and now as you see full dominance um, it's just impossible to move practically any piece the knight on d2 is pinned the knight on f1 is tied down to protection uh, of the knight on d2 the queen on e2 is also uh, tied down to protection of the knight on d2 and the pawn on a2 is about to fall so uh, this is this is just a hopeless picture a3 queen f5 transferring the queen g4 and this is a further weakening bishop f4 king g2 queen takes e5 so now uh, Aronian uh, made a very practical decision two bishops against two knights will be much better in any end game uh, it's pointless to play for any bigger advantage this is just sufficient and let's see how he, how he converted this uh, knight e3 bishop b2 so now the a pawn is, is the target knight b1 as you see uh, both knights are horribly placed because they just need to play a passive role of protecting those two weaknesses that uh, that are on the board uh, so the knight on b1 is tied down to protection of a3 the knight on e3 is tied down to protection of c4 king f7 king f3 king f6 king e4 king g5 now the penetration on king side comes knight d5 takes takes and that is, is something just erroneous Aron just calculated so king h4 and knight d2 and bishop a3 um white was never actually creating any threat of playing king f5 king e6 king d7 because then uh, at the very end black can just play bishop e5 and make everything under control so again a great display of how the bishops nicely dominate uh, the knights and let's move on to the last example uh, this is Ljubojevic Karpov a very short example uh, but some something I really want to show you because uh, this position actually looks quite innocent. There is uh, non-symmetrical pawn structure. Both players have something to play on. It seems that white is maybe better on on queen side. Uh, black is in turn putting some pressure on on king side. Um, at the same time, white has some tactical ideas on f7, but he also has an a file. Uh, on the other hand, black has the better pawn structure, so it looks uh, reasonably balanced. But with just one move, Ljubojevic turns things upside down, turns the tables and uh, seizes great advantage. Um, if you have been waiting for any exercises, then this is definitely the position you would like to uh, invest some time in. Um, this is really worth thinking about. So if you need some time, if you feel like solving this one, feel free it's not that it's uh, winning with white directly but uh, well i would call it white to move and seize advantage in one uh, or in two moves so feel free to pause the video take as much time as you need because now i'm going to tell you what happened and what happened was truly amazing knight e3 uh, and it looks like an impossible move even illegal because it's just putting the white queen into direct danger because after bishop takes b3 the queen is lost but so is the queen on c6 so you could also argue okay so what about the bishop on g2 
Well, the bishop on g2 cannot really be taken because then white plays queen takes f7 and gets immediate access to the black king. And this made Karpov uh, play the move that he didn't want to play. Uh, and this was bishop takes b3. Bishop takes c6. And now after this move, it's quite clear that the bishop is a very active piece on c6. While the bishop on b3 is struggling to find uh, a good square to go back. Because in fact, um, the only square where it will not be captured for free is e6. Uh, so in order to, to save this bishop, uh, Karpov played h6. But this was met with a very precise move, and the one I really like, uh, showing that Ljubojevic really knew what to do here, rook a3. And this uh, in-between move does not allow black to maintain the bishop pair. Um, Karpov chose to play h takes g5, rook takes b3, bishop f8, trying to improve the bishop, which was doing literally nothing on f8, um, king g2, and also... Ljubojevic applies the policy of improving uh, worst place pieces. Uh, in fact, he's not rushing anywhere. He's just uh, he just needs to make sure that every single piece is involved, and that um, once th those pieces are placed on optimal squares, he will be able to um, to make some progress on the queen side. Um, rook e6, bishop b5, and this is a typical case of. Um, Two knights fighting for the same square and this square here is f6 because as you see uh, the knight on d7 is doing literally nothing and the optimal square for it would be f6 but this square is already occupied by the other knight so uh, that's why we say that two knights fight for the same square because there is not a single better square on the board well probably besides d4 but this is uh, not realistic in the current uh, position so uh, what black would love to see is just taking two knights off the board or preferably exchange a knight for a bishop but i'm sure Ljubojevic would never agree to that um so after bishop b5 uh, karpov just played king g7 i think he just couldn't find a better move h3 preventing g4 as you see improvement improvement constant improvement of the position there's nothing to to rush for bishop e7 Bishop c3 over protecting b4 and that prepares a deadly maneuver of rook a3 followed by rook a7 or rook a6 or even rook a8 penetrating on queen side and making great great damage. Um, so bishop d6, rook a3, bishop b8. This does prevent rook a7 but on the other hand it puts the bishop on a very passive position. Uh, the bishop will be protected by the knight on d7, but this knight is hit by the bishop on b5, so it's it already feels like black's position is a bit loose and um, things may, may happen, tactically. Rook a8, hitting the bishop, rook e7, bishop d2, and that's another strong move, uh, which aims to prove that the pawn on g5 is not as strong as it may uh, it may have um, seemed it, it it may seem to be um, the ball on g5 may be just easily a target here and by transferring the bishop on d2 already maybe a knight c4 move or something like this can be um, can be a problem for black. Uh, black tried to escape with some active play so e4 and of course d4 the knight cannot be allowed to go to e4. Um, bishop c7, rook c8, knight f8, bishop c3, and that prepares uh, d5. Is if this bishop gets open and the knight is on f6 is going to be pinned, then th this is probably going to be game over. Um, but for that to happen, Ljubojevic still needs to prevent bishop e5 idea because if white played d5 immediately. Black would react with bishop e5, neutralizing the bishop or even exchanging it um, with, well, the game still going on. Knight h7, bishop c6, a very strong move because now um, knight c4 is available. A moment ago knight c4 would be met with knight d5, so bishop c6 controls d5 square. Now the knight will go to c4 and further the pawn will jump, will just go to d5 
uh, with a winning uh, continuation. Knight f8, b5 strengthening the position, and that's actually where uh, Karpov resigned in view of bishop b4, um, which is pretty much unstoppable because if black goes bishop d6, the knight c4 um, pushes the knight, the bishop back, and then either d5 or bishop b4, depending on Ljubojevic's taste. So crushing Karpov like this in a very strategic fashion is uh, something that didn't happen in history of chess very often, but Ljubojevic um, made this happen. And this is yet another example of how the bishop can be used for uh, dominating opponent's pieces, not necessarily the knights, which was uh, the case here, but also the rooks, as it was shown in the first example um, uh, when, when I've shown you my game that I played. Um, so the first practical tip for you, for your practical games, uh, keep in mind to open the position when you have the bishop pair, make sure that your bishops breathe, so to speak. The more open diagonals, the better for the bishops and the worse for your opponent. Uh, I hope you enjoyed these examples and thanks for watching.